with uh, just a little introduction, and then we'll, we'll get into the business of the agenda. So if you need to talk, make sure to turn on your button and speak right into the microphone. All right, so um, I, can, I can start, I guess. So hi, I'm Rachel Falk Cook. Uh, I'm the chair of this commission. I've been the chair for a year and a half now. Um, it really exciting stuff that we've done. My background is in public health, but I, I work at UCD in the School of Nursing doing uh, research and equity. It's me. All right. Let's. Yes. We'll go down line. Hi, I'm Tracy Wittenberg. I'm one of the new uh, commission members, and um, I've lived in Davis for mm, 35 years now, and uh, just recently retired from UC Davis. And I work there uh, in administration, uh, in the College of Arts and Science, primarily. We you know, had a lot of different jobs, and uh, had a great career there. Now, um, I also have a family that I've raised in Davis, and I have a, an adult son with a disability. So there's a lot of things about this committee and the commission that uh, interest me. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our new commissioners. Uh, my name is Judy Ennis. I've been on the commission for around five years now, I think. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to be in every role. I started out as the alternate. I was vice chair, I was chair, and now I'm a regular commission member again. Um, so I have a background in education, but I also work in housing. So thank you so much for choosing to serve. Hello, everybody. My name is Deanna Swerdla. I've been in the commission for a little over a year now. I'm currently co-vice chair. Um, I have a background in food insecurity. I work for the San Francisco Morning Food Bank. And I'm really happy to see all your new faces here. And Deanna and I are birthday twins. <laughs> Very important. Very important. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy Wong Chen. And uh, my family and I have had a long history of receiving social services and housing assistance. And I've worked with uh, youth and families, from low income families, and underrepresented communities. And so uh, the work here is very important. It's uh, my fourth year on the commission. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Brown Blake. I have been a Davis resident for 13 years, I think. Um, I'm a parent of students um, at Davis High School. Um, I'm a nurse. Uh, that's my profession. I'm also a professor at Sac State um, in the School of Nursing. Um, and I've done um, a lot of work. My uh, professional background is in community and public health. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris, and I am a relatively new resident of Davis, relative to everyone else. I've been here about one year. Um, my wife and I have been living overseas and working um, in humanitarian development contexts or a lot of different places for the last 10 years, and we settled in Davis, and I just started work with, actually today, for my first day, with uh, United Way um, in Sacramento, and, and my focus is of data and analytics and evaluation and um, accountability and really passionate about community engagement as well. So I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. Great. Welcome aboard. We're thrilled to have you here. So it's a, it's a, it's, we're a really good group. We do really interesting work and we're thrilled that you are, have chosen to serve with us. All right. So let's get started. So do we have an agenda? Do we have a motion? Anyone? Anyone? I can motion it. Okay. Motion? Oh, sorry, motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. All right, second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? All right, we've got an agenda. Good stuff. All right, so let's see. Let's move along. Do we have any announcements from staff? We haven't met on a regular in a long time. Do we have any announcements? Not, not tonight. Not to me. Okay. All right, sounds good. All right, public comment. Do we have anyone here for public comment? For general public comment? 
No. All right, good stuff. Keep moving. Let's see, the minutes. Does everyone know to take a look at the minutes? For those of us that were there, I think only, do we, we have a form for the minutes, because I think the three of you will have to understand. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I thought the minutes were good. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Do we need to read the written public comments? I don't think those, I think that was an op-ed. No. no. Um, I thought the minutes were great. Any opposition? All right, I motion to approve the minutes from August 1st. Oh, sorry, there, there's one small thing. Oh, oh sorry, right. um, At the very end, it says uh, there was a motion by Ennis to approve the draft, and it was seconded by Ennis, so I don't know who actually did the motion or <laughs> what she can have done. <laughs> we'll make that correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, I motion to approve the, amend the minutes as amended. With the amendment, sorry, my daughter's tutor is calling. He uses Skype. Good time. Um, <laughs> all right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We have three abstentions. Any opposed? Nope. All right. Let's keep it moving. Look at that. Palomino Place. Hi, everybody. I am a face you are not going to see all the time, once in a while. Here. I'm Sherry Metzger. I'm the Community Development Director. And we typically bring projects before you that need to have a recommendation for their affordable housing plan. And that's why I'm here tonight. The Palomino Place project is a request for approval of a vesting tentative subdivision map. I know that sounds like a very important thing, but basically what it is, it's a map that creates lots. The Palomino Place project is just to the east of Wild Horse, um, basically on the city limit line. I'm sure you all saw the project in your maps. It's a proposal for a 163-lot subdivision, and one of the 163 lots would accommodate a multifamily residential project. On the uh, drawing that's on the screen now, it's the one in the blue. That would accommodate a multifamily project that would have between 33 and 45 multifamily residential dwelling units in it. On the, I'm sorry, not the blue, in the pink. red. Yeah. Right over pink. Is that what it is? In pink? Yeah. Okay. I, I believe you. <laughs> so, in the pink lot, I'm sorry, the one that fronts right on Covell is the multifamily lot, not the blue. The blue is a pentathlon facility that's proposed to be included in the project. In your staff report, you should have a copy of this particular map, which I would suggest you refer to if you have any particular uh, reference questions as far as the rest of what I'm about to tell you. So, this particular project has been in with the planning department for a while. It was submitted under the something called the Builder's Remedy, which I'm not going to try to explain in infinite detail to you, but it's a legal provision that allows someone to submit a project regardless of what the general plan and land use zoning is. In this particular instance, the general plan land use and zoning is agricultural, which obviously normally wouldn't be consistent with a project like this. But because it was submitted under Builder's Remedy, when we did not have a certified housing element, it is legal to do so. One of the provisions that was included in the project, as is required by law, is 20% of the units have to be made affordable to low and all the provisions under low income individuals. And that is what is proposed on the pink lot. One of the things that we have, we being the city attorney's office, has negotiated with the developer is the possibility of units up to 45 units on the site being included on this particular project site. And the reason for that is we believe that it would make the project a little more economically feasible than the 33, which is the bare minimum that's required to meet the provisions of the law. 
So we are here seeking your recommendation to the Planning Commission, who will have the ultimate say on this particular map, recommending the 45 dwelling units be required on this particular parcel. At this point, we are in the midst of seeking comments on the draft EIR for the project. That comment period will close later this month, and then the final EIR will be prepared for consideration by the Planning Commission. If you're interested in looking at that document, it is posted on the City's website on the project page for the Palomino project. When the final EIR is ready, it will be brought before the Planning Commission along with the proposed project itself and they will take action on the project sometime we expect before the end of the year. As far as what happens after that, on a typical map, uh, the project applicant has a couple of years to final the map, which means actually go through the process of doing all the requirements under the conditions of approval and getting it recorded to actually create the lots that you see on the drawing there, and then, um, then actually constructing it. I would expect that they will take about a year to do all the things that are required to get the map recorded, and then another year beyond that to actually begin the construction of housing. Of course, that's just an estimate on my part. There is a representative from the uh, applicant's office here this evening, if you wish to hear from him. He may be able to give you a little better idea of what the time frame is that they're estimating as far as when they think they'll be able to move forward with the project. So, as I said, what I'm here for this evening is to seek recommendation on the affordable housing plan or the affordable housing component of the project, which is 33 to 45 affordable units to be constructed on the pink or red colored parcel <laughs> up there on Covell. And I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. I think we need to do public comment. Mm -hmm. Not yet. <coughs> yeah. Oh, okay, great. So, um, we want to say thank you to Community Development for presenting the project and the work of the project. Um, affordable housing staff wants to speak specifically to the affordable housing piece. We're, 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 um, we're recommending that um, the approval tonight is conditionally approved for the subdivision piece, but we're asking that there be uh, conditions placed on that that would require them to come back to the Social Services Commission once the affordable housing plan has been comprehensive in consideration of any mitigating factors that come up in the EIR, um, as well as a more comprehensive plan that would give specifics where the, about the units. Because right now we don't have any idea of the size of the units, or they just offered one, two, and three bedroom units, but we don't have any specifics on the size of the units, the feasibility of the units. Um, they have, again, as Sherry mentioned, there is builder's remedy, which requires 20%, which is over and above the 15% inclusionary uh, zoning. So we're, we, we do agree with that, but we're just asking that they come back after the more comprehensive plan has been put together. All right, anything else? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, now let's go to the public comment. All right, any public commenters, please? Hi, good evening. I'm Matt Keesling with Taylor Wiley and Keesling here tonight on behalf of the Project Advocate, uh, the Palomino Place LLC. I want to thank Sherry for giving a quick overview. I have a few slides I want to run through just to give you a better sense of the project, um, and then I'll respond also to the comment that staff made about a desire to have the project come back. Um, so Palomino Place is the former horse ranch that was a remainder parcel. It's 25 acres at the southeast of Wild Horse Ranch. Um, we have proposed a tentative subdivision map to build 163 new homes there. Um, I brought a laser pointer, which I don't get to use very often. So I'll just quickly show you, though, um, product types. We have cottage units, which are this dark orange in the middle and down at the bottom. 
Uh, we have halfplex and townhomes, which are the mustard color, and then a traditional single family residential in the two shades of yellow. The different shades are based upon uh, parcel size, so you'll have a slightly smaller single family detached, maybe like 1900 square feet on the darker ones, um, and then around 2000 to 2400 on the on the yellow ones. And then, as Sherry mentioned, the affordable rental housing is located at the entryway on Cobell Boulevard. And if I could have the next slide, please. So what we think we have here with Palomino Place is a true mix of housing types and unit types for a diversity of owners as well as rental housing. Again, the 19 cottage units, these are small units, two bedroom, two bath is what we anticipate. Things that were traditionally built more frequently in the 20s and 30s. Um, it is a popular trend though with the unaffordability of housing, seeing smaller unit sizes come back and we are implementing a first time home buyers program for these cottage units. Next slide, please. Uh, we then have the 29 townhomes. Uh, this is, we anticipate three bedroom, two bath, uh, but um, small yards to no yards, um, parking off the rear or off an alley, and, and a more dense product type that could be attached um, with the air gap. I think you're familiar with that where it looks like an attached product, but it's technically a detached housing unit. Um, after the cottages, we then have the 82 traditional single-family homes, ranging in size. I think our smaller unit types were thinking 1650 square feet, up to 2400 square feet, so a true range of, of product types on the traditional single-family homes. So again, those are all for sale options, so you have everything from an entry-level home all the way up to a, a home that I think you know, is probably more consistent with the types of size of lots you see in traditional famous neighborhoods and the surrounding neighborhood of Wild Horse. Next slide, please. Um, I think that was in the end of the slides. We oh. all done as a... I, have, I had several more. Oh. And so because those are in question and the, the slides that I have are... Uh, oh, I don't have... I'm sorry. Not all of them. I the whole yeah. slideshow. Yeah. So we had questions about the remaining slide, but if you'd like to speak to it. Yeah, I'd love to that. talk to it. <laughs> so pursuant to the City of Davis's ordinance for um, for sale units, so you have affordable housing ordinance, it applies to rental products. So if you bring forward a rental apartment complex, there's a certain way that you calculate your affordable obligations. And then if you bring forward a for sale community like Palomino Place, you have a different way of calculating it. For a for sale community, your obligation is based upon the type of unit you're bringing forward. You have a certain commitment um, for parcels that are over 5,000 square feet, where it's 25% affordable units. Uh, for parcels that are single family detached but under 5,000 square feet, it's 15% requirement. And then for attached units, like we're proposing for the townhomes, it's a 10%. And your provision says in 1805050A1F, because I like to cite things, that when you have a mix of unit types, you actually calculate them all separately and then add them together. Uh, so pursuant to your code, our obligation for this development project was 25.5 units, which rounds up to 26. Um, what we are proposing is 33 units, which is 20% of the 163. Um, that uh, number was not by mistake. It helped us to comply with state housing law that says if you bring forward a project that has 20% affordable housing, that you're allowed to avail yourself of the builder's remedy, which was the reason why we brought up that number. Um, however, in discussions with city staff, as well as council members, there was an expressed a desire to see more affordable units at that site. We've also been in conversations with numerous builders, um, and there's a desire from them as well to see um, additional units. And so we have committed to the council that if it is the desire of the city to have us do 45 affordable units as opposed to 33, that we are amenable to that. Um, which I believe is why part of the recommendation tonight that you're being asked to put forward to Planning Commission, if you're putting forward a recommendation to approve this, affordable housing plan would be to indicate at the 33 as proposed or at the 45 that's been indicated that they're interested in. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, is there any way that I can get these on an overhead projector? Um, and we really 
they don't have the rest of them? No. And I'm sorry, but we don't have them. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll show the next one. I just wanted to point out that, again, here are some unit types, and I did see in the staff report it was called into question whether there was adequate space on the site to accommodate the type of units that we're building. So on this is actually an example of an affordable housing complex in the city of Davis that's 38 units, um, and it would more than fit on the project site that we've been looking at. We actually have talked to this builder as well um, and said, you know, if you want to just copy that one and put it on our parcel, that would work quite nicely. Um, um, so I, I think when you talk about the fact that the parcel size is, uh, I want to say it's 66,000 square feet, um, we would be looking at four floors. And when you took the calculations that were in the staff report, I think it's about 11,000 square foot base to get 12 units on the ground floor. And then obviously you would build up, thinking that on the fourth floor you could receive the units a little bit, so you have less square footage on the fourth floor, and you end up with the 45 units all within the footprint. Uh, we currently also have the site size so that we can accommodate 33 parking stalls is what's shown. Um, we had our planner put that together to show that we could park every unit in a one-to-one. -one. Um, switching to 45, again, we would add a fourth floor most likely, and we would need to reconfigure the layout of the building in order to achieve 45 parking stalls. Um, the city does not require us to park it in a one-to-one, -one, but quite frankly, most state grant funding opportunities want you to have at least one parking stall per, per unit, so we'd probably be pursuing that. Um, and then again, if you wanted to switch to 45 units and make it your recommendation, our total project would be 175 units with 45 affordable units, meaning that we would be at 26% of total units affordable. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Uh, lastly, I'd just like to say, I uh, heard the recommendation from staff that you if you're inclined to make a recommendation of approval of the affordable housing plan for this project to condition it to come back. I will say that we are developers, we're creating lots, but we will not be building it. We will not be building any of those single family detached homes, nor the, the affordable housing on site. Um, we are amenable to having our builder once selected come back and present that project to you when there's more detail. Um, and the reason our application says one, two, and three bedroom units is quite often there's a, a mix of unit types that a builder knows. They're trying to serve a certain um, market, right? And so they're designing a project at this particular location. We're not in an urban core. And so I think you're going to be thinking about what, what type of unit you're trying to build in order to serve a certain segment of the population. Uh, we have great proximity to schools, so I would tend to think that it's going to lean towards two and three bedroom units to accommodate families. Um, but again, we want to keep that flexibility open so that we can get the best product possible from the builder when they come forward with the builder. The city gets the assurance that they get the number of units that the city wants, and then we have enough flexibility so that a builder can, one, build the product they want, but also they know where grant funding is available. Right, and often you're shooting for certain funding sources, and those funding sources want you to have a certain mix of unit types and a certain depth of affordability. So we're more than happy once that builder is in tow and selected to have them come back to this commission and present more details on the project to all of you. Um, and we hope that you can support the project. I'm happy to answer questions, or I'll get out of your way. Oh, we do. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jeff Stolnick. I'm the Vice Chair of the uh, Senior Citizens Commission. I did notice on the Palomino Place project that uh, you have low income, but there are no very low income in that. Um, that concerns me a little bit. Uh, I'm concerned with the homeless senior citizens in Davis. Not just they don't just say they're not just homeless. They can't get services. They don't have the ability to get medical care or social services. Uh, and the first very good step for that would be getting them housed. So they would have a place. Uh, 
I did talk to Davis Community Meals and Paul's Place, and the people that can make it there, they've uh, told me there are 20, 20 of them are senior citizens. Um, and that only includes people that can get their services there, get their meals there. There we should probably double that or more the homeless population of senior citizens of Davis. Uh, another thing that's making it harder for them is the police are now <clears throat> harassing homeless people. It's a new California thing from our Supreme, from our United States Supreme Court. Uh, it's making it even harder to find these people because now they're finding. I would like to see uh, in any any projects that are coming up that have low income housing to have also share of it for very low income and get these people housed with the near medical care they need with the social services they need. Thank you. Thank you. I can clarify it for um, sure. Our uh, uh, inclusionary housing ordinance requires that half of the units be low income and the other half be affordable to very low income individuals. So they will be providing some units. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Let's discuss. Okay. Uh, right. Oh, okay. All right. I want to add. Um, Again, I just wanted to reiterate that staff and the social service department are okay with the project being approved conditionally. Um, there are three different things that have been introduced in this project that um, right now they're, they're still very unclear. And those are the regulatory concerns. Our inclusionary zone requires 15%. The builder's remedy requires 20%. And if there is some level of public state financing, it could go as high as 25%. So not having the parameters of the exact numbers on the units right now make it very difficult to determine what the affordability layer is going to be. We did understand that it's, a develop it's at a developer stage right now, but we're asking that once the affordable housing developer has been the identified, that they bring the project back the only the affordable housing piece to the Social Services Commission for review. Thank you for the clarification. Are we ready to discuss now? Any public commenters? All right, ready to discuss. Commissioner Ennis. I do have a question just to start. I understand that we received the worksheet in our packet, but I don't think we received any other materials. Anything else we saw ourselves. So I wanted to clarify to Sherry and Mr. Keesling when you were talking about what we saw in our staff report. And I wanted to check with the rest of the commission that this is true for everyone. Okay. Oh. Commission, did you go online? Yeah, I went online and I said there, but not in the email. I didn't see, yeah, it was just this worksheet in the email, but I went to the DPS website and looked at the practice. Yeah, full um, affordable housing plan. Right, I did as well, but I just wanted to note that in terms of our preparation, this was the first time that the commission is being presented with the information, just so you know. So we didn't see the graphic, we didn't receive that. Yeah. So it sounds like some of us went and looked online, but um, there might be more questions. We should spend a little bit more time to make sure that you're all on the same page because we didn't have the opportunity to do that study in advance. I just want to clarify that now. Um, Oh, I can wait on the question. Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay, I do want to say um, that I I appreciate that this is above the minimum if it goes to the twenty six apologies. If it goes to the twenty six percent, because those minimums are exactly what it says, a minimum. It's a floor, it's not the ceiling. So I am grateful that this has bumped up to a higher number and that conditional 
approval based on the fact that it's bumped up to 26% bodes very well. Um, I would say that I appreciate Sherry and, and the affordable housing team, Dana and Iris, clarifying the breakdown between very low income, moderate, and low. And that I see here that for right now, it says only for low and it has the specifications around the, the veteran sizes. And again, I appreciate Mr. Kiesling said this is a developer stage. We don't have the builder's detail. We don't have the square footage. We can't tell if the units are adequate and equivalent to what the market rate of units are. So it would have to be a conditional approval because we don't have that information that would give it a full, a full approval. So I appreciate that work that that's made clear to us now on uh, what those conditions should be for coming back. Um, and it sounds like they're willing to do that. So that's good news. So I think my comment is in the past, we have been guided to focus only on whether or not it adheres to the affordable housing plan, the affordable housing matches within the ordinance. And what Mr. Kiesling just described on the ordinance, I think could bear a little bit more review based on what he said about the breakdown on if it's the parcel sizes, is I know that the city completed our for rent ordinance. Is the entire project for sale? Are there any, okay, he's nodding. For those of you that can't see Mr. Kiesling, he's indicating to me with his, uh, with his nod that the entire project is for sale, so that answers that question. Okay, I have a question, but I'm going to see the floor further. Yeah, go ahead. All right, yeah, sorry. I have a question about, so, and I see that 100% um, of the low-income units are all in that four-story building, is that right? I'm just, and I guess I mean, it's like, that it's great that it's over the minimum. And I'm just wondering if there's any, consider, if there was any consideration about potentially having a more mixed, like maybe some of the cottages could be low-income, so it's not just like, this is the low-income building and everyone else is not. Um, I'm just wondering if that was considered. Yes. Um, this is actually our second affordable housing plan for this project. Our initial affordable housing plan was considerably different. Um, it was integrated in one community. Um, what we did was created the same lot, more or less, that you're seeing, uh, the same lot and layout. Um, but on our larger lots, what we had committed to was building ADUs. At the time, we were going to build the houses and we were going to put deed restrictions on every ADU so that the ADUs were the affordable housing. Um, people have a lot of feelings about ADUs and using ADUs as affordable housing. In my experience, it's from about a decade ago when people said they will be affordable by design. And so there was no actual deed restriction placed on them. And then it turned out that they weren't actually affordable and they were rented out. Right? So people said, that's a horrible plan. So what we sought to do was actually build them and deed restrict them right off the bat um, so that they actually would be rented out and they'd be required to be rented out at affordable prices. Um, but the response that we got from the city was not favorable due to a great deal of community discussion that had taken place about ADUs. And there was a desire not to reopen that count of worms, quite frankly, I think until all of you had thought that through. Um, I have seen projects that have done that um, successfully. Um, but so we pivoted and we said, what other options are available to us through the ordinance and looked at what the ordinance provided for. And quite frankly, it's easier when you're a master developer to identify one location because you're then going to bring in a builder and that builder is going to have management. And so they usually want the units all at one site so that they're not managing scattered sites throughout a project. So that's how we landed on just identifying one location for one structure. Yes. Absolutely. Mr. Kiesley, before you sit down, is it possible, um, based on the comment, and by the way, thank you as another commissioner on another commission coming and speaking here. I really appreciate that. I wish we all did that more. So thanks for that. But what, um, what our colleague brought up um, about the need for senior housing and what Commissioner Spedlock mentioned, is there any opening to having cottages? Uh, that would be a fantastic fit for cottages. Um, we are not the restricting cottages. We have the first time home buyer program that we're implementing for cottages. Um, but as of now, they're they are going to be market rate. Market rate. 
is there any possibility um, to the point of my colleague of having it be more distributed within the project that some other properties could also be restricted, or has that already been determined at this point, and it's just about the raw percentage? I think it's about the raw percentage, unfortunately. Okay. We are anticipating that we are still going to have a use bill without the, throughout the community, um, but they will not be deep restricted as we had previously proposed. Um, I will say to the other commissioners' comments that the developer of this subdivision is also the developer of the Brett Wood subdivision, um, and Mercy is completing senior affordable. We have 150 units of senior affordable at that location. So it, there has been a considerable commitment from this developer towards senior affordable housing within Davis. And just a reminder to the commission that uh, right now, uh, we don't want to put the developer on the spot, because right now what we're looking at is approving the subdivision and the affordability component of the subdivision. So a lot of this information will come back to you with more detail, but tonight it's really approving a subdivision and then the location of the subdivision and there's going to be an affordability commitment. And I'll point out also, um, it does not get to your point about distribution, but I do get a sense that you're hoping for more units. Our settlement agreement with the city says that we will, at the city's request, increase our number of units to 45. Uh, that's the desire of the community. I will say there's nothing that precludes our affordable builder from coming back with a proposal that works for them and fits on the space that would limit their ability from increasing that. Um, they still would be able to avail themselves of various state laws that allow you to increase density when you're doing 100% affordable projects. Um, so they may come back to you with a building that is not at all what our planner had envisioned at the site. It will be at this location. It will be multifamily. It will be consistent with our secret document, but they have <laughs> flexibility and intentionally so because we want somebody to bring forward a good project. And quite frankly, we're happy to have it come back because we'd like you all to review it and agree that it's a good project. So. Oh, yes, well, Mr. Lefebvre, I have one question. So um, you had mentioned that this would be four stories, but it sounds like, sorry. <laughs> just just <laughs> take So the way that our, so we work with an architect as well as land planners and engineers. Our land planner laid it out to be three stories, anticipating that it would be 11 units roughly on every floor, and then an additional 20% square footage for common areas. Um, when the city said 45, we indicated then let's analyze this in the CEQA document as a four-story building because undoubtedly if we're going to 45, we'll go to four floors. So that's what's being analyzed and assumed, but again, it's up to all of you. And all of the other units are either single level or two stories, correct? All of the four-cell units. The four-cell units, uh, the, the townhomes I think could actually be three stories. Uh, there is a, is there any way I can go back to my first slide with the main, um, this area here, those are townhomes, and there is a thought that there might be a builder interested in doing those three stories, so you would have a step down from the, the larger building, stepping down into the community as you go further north. Yeah, because my only thought was just about the aesthetics a little bit, about the fact that the affordable homes would be right, you know, on the busy part of the street, coming into the, uh, development and then all the other homes would be much you know shorter and more you know a little more spaced out and stuff so yes um i i concede the point that it is at the entryway um part of the design was to put our greatest density down closer to cobell so you have the smaller product type and more dense product type toward the roadway toward the transit um, and then making those more walkable with your lighter densities as you go further back, but that also helps to do is feather traffic, right? So the more traffic generating users, the denser product type is at the base, and then you get less cars as you go further and further back. So you're not sending all the cars to the north of the project. Sorry, before you sit fast. I'm just gonna stay. As far as the fourth floor, will it be ADA accessible or will it be a stairwell? So, 
full disclosure, I've been in conversations with about five affordable builders that are interested in the site. Um, I am happy to say we have good interest. Um, I don't feel affordable housing does. Um, I would think that for purposes of getting state financing for the project, they will all be accessible. Um, that's just a hunch, but I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I'll just acquiesce on what he just said. I was just thinking the same thing, is if they go with state funding, it will have to be ADA accessible. I have, I have a question. Yes. Just for, just for my personal um, understanding, because I'm still unclear as to what we gain from approving the condition, as opposed to just getting the details figured out and then come back and get the approval then. So what am I missing here? Is in, in the process, in this whole process, what are we gaining by approving now with a condition as opposed to just come back with all the details and then review it? I think um, what we gain is we're getting a commitment from the developer at this point for the project with moving forward and going ahead and giving them a conditional approval versus the um, time constraints that are placed on the builder's remedy and not meeting those time constraints and telling them to come back. So I think right now, with the conditional approval, it allows them to move forward with the constraints that were placed in the um, builder's remedy. Okay, but as far as the affordability aspects of it, we are not sacrificing with a... No. With a okay, that's just, that's what I wanted to make clear. Thank you. Like, like we said, right now, we're just coming to you with the builder that said that they'd like to present this project. Um, in order to present this project, it needs to come before you. What you're looking at is whether or not we want the planning com commission to approve the subdivision that they that they propose. And once you and we do want an affordable component of that, um, and we'd like the builder to come back after they after the planning commission has approved the project to move forward. We'd like them to come back when they've got more details um, and a development partner in place to talk with us more about what the unit could look like, the concepts, and all those different things. Right now, we're too early in the process for that, but to even start the process, we need this initial approval for the subdivision, and once we have that, then they can move forward and we can get, get going on that. Thank you. Commissioner Ennis, do you have more questions? All right, do we have more questions? So I just want to clarify, so if we're agreeing to affordable housing, it does not preclude them in Incorporating the very low housing penalties. No, it does not preclude them. And to be quite honest, um, depending on what type of state financing they use, there might be some provisions in that financing that indicate they take a dip, deeper dive into affordability. Great. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, can you put the recommendation back up? All right, do we need all three of these as three separate motions? Yes. Yes, all right, we can be adjourned. All right, anyone want to? One, 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 we have three, okay, so we have three yeah. new commissioners and we have three motions that we need to make. So we would love to offer you the opportunity. So you just have to motion that and then I ask if people approve and or if people don't approve. So would anyone like to take the first one? Sure, I'll make a motion to approve the first recommendation. Um, uh, whether or not uh, the Planning Commission conditionally will conditionally approve affordable housing in uh, 0623 for the Palomino Unit Place subdivision project. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Did we get a second? Oh, Sean. Uh, I'll second it. Okay, yeah. Oh, second. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. The motion passes. Unanimously. All right, let's go to recommendation two. Do we have any new commissioners that are interested? I think since we're full tonight, I'm not. I'm alternate, right? So I can oh, just... you are an alternate. All right. All right, Commissioner would you like this one? Sure. So, motion to recommend um, that the planning commission, um, whether the affordable um, housing plan, should provide an additional 12 units for a total of 
45 for portable units. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the second one? Uh, <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. I think that um, I think that you can make motions. I think you just can't vote. I think. Is that right for alternate? No. no? Okay, all right. I may vote. Yeah, only. This will be all vacated. <laughs> <laughs> can we, before we move to the third one, yeah. can we add in that it will come back to the Social Services Commission? Yeah. If that's not explicitly mm -hmm. stated here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I can add. Yeah. yeah. So that's an amendment to Please. the third. Yeah, to whoever is taking this one up. Okay. To make sure we include that. All right, anyone want to take this one? I can do it. All right, good stuff. Recommend condition approval based on number one, developers provide a comprehensive AHP to encompass mitigating factors and conditions of environmental review. Two, developer provides design map with site specific location and square footage allocation based on bedroom size. And three, that it comes back to this commission before proceeding. That's right. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we've got three motions passed. That's good stuff. Okay, we're gonna keep chugging along. We have quite a packed agenda today. All right, big stuff. Our council subcommittee um, on the proposed process to, to place tasks and items on the commission agenda. Welcome. I've never seen you before. I have no idea who you are. As much time as I spend in this room, I barely stand here. Um, so my name is Kelly Stackowitz. I am the assistant city manager. So welcome to the new commissioners, and it's good to see the returning commissioners. Um, I've spent some time with this commission in the past. Um, Dana, can I ask you to go to the... Um, I put the... the Thank you for bearing with me for that. So I am here tonight to gather input and feedback. Um, over the past year plus, we've had lots of different conversations um, internally and some with, with commissions about uh, commissions and the, the process and you know, what different commissions are talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's been a lot of questions from council, from different commissions, commissioners, and from staff about process to get things on an agenda. So in terms of some of the items, like the item you just heard, those are clear. The staff knows they have to bring them forward based on our own you know, our municipal code or something else that we're specifically looking for feedback from. Uh, those get put on the agenda and we consider those to be staff initiated. Um, there may be certain things where our city council or our city council subcommittee is saying we need this commission's input on X and that X, whatever that is, that then goes on an agenda. But then there's this other um, cohort of activities or ideas or projects or tasks, pick your favorite one, <coughs> that um, the commission might initiate or want to initiate. And how does that go on an agenda? Right now, it differs across commissions, um, depending on that particular commission, maybe who's the chair, maybe who's the staff person, maybe you know whatever it is that they're looking at. And so we don't have a lot of consistency across the city, which then generates some of the confusion. So um, this is an, an attempt or a, a, a suggestion, um, a proposal, to try to uh, systematize how really it's the commission initiated projects get put onto the agenda. And if you see from the chart, we had a slightly different chart that we took to um, 
the commissions that met earlier in the month, and we're just going to all the commissions this month. This one, we tried to simplify it a little bit at the, the bottom because we're really looking at that section C. Um, that is at the bottom, and hopefully all of you have, can bring it up on your screens. They are in front of you if you want. Uh, initially, uh, basically what it is is it says that um, if there is an item that the commission initiates or wants to initiate, you bring it up at a meeting and there's at least a consensus from a majority of the commission that this is something that you want to look at. So it's not just one commissioner's project. Um, if there's a consensus from the full commission, then it is looked at by staff, the council liaison to the commission. Um, if there was a sub council subcommittee, then that they would they would jump in at that point. Um, and then in looking at it, the staff slash council liaison slash council subcommittee, if there's one, um, would recommend that yes, this falls into the purview of the commission, this won't take undue resources in order to work on, and we would recommend approval putting it on the, you know, the next commission agenda or whatever you guys decided you wanted to talk about it. Or, no, for whatever reason, this doesn't, uh, it doesn't fall under the purview of the commission, it will take too many resources, um, doesn't meet with council goals or priorities, then it would not recommend approval. And then we tell the commission that the commission would be given the opportunity if you wanted to adjust it, you could. If not, you just want to say this, we want this to go to the full council. The full council at that point would decide yes or no, uh, this goes on a future agenda or it doesn't. Um, in the former one, it would be just provided to the council as informational. So that is the proposal that is in front of the commission tonight. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to all the commissions throughout the course of September. Um, we're taking all of the feedback and information and sharing that with the council subcommittee on commissions. They'll determine at that point, based on the information that they get, um, what they want to do, they want to bring something to the full council or not, and what that looks like. Um, we have had commissions just provide individual feedback. Um, we've had uh, at least one of the commissions make a motion and provide that recommendation that will take forward to the subcommittee. Um, you can do whatever you want. That, that part is up to you. I will stop now um, and let you guys ask any questions and take public comment. I'm going to sit over here, so I'll jump up and down if needed. Do we have any questions before public comment? Sure. What was the motion that the other commission made? The one that I am familiar with is one of the commissions felt that the process that they currently use, which is the chair and the vice chair working with the staff liaison to put together the agendas, um, was working for them, and so they made a motion that they want to continue to do that. I think the rest of the commissions have um, just provided general feedback. Um, I don't think the other ones made motions. Okay. All right, now we're open for public comment. Welcome back. Yeah, I think that, that part of what this proposal does is that any single council member or the council liaison can veto <laughs> of what the commission wants to put on the agenda. So if you all have a, a something that comes up that you're all interested in and you want to put on the agenda, it can be vetoed by any single council member or your council liaison, which sort of takes a lot of your ability away. So I think it's best that the commission decide what goes on the agenda. And you work with the city council on that. You know, they have subcommittees, people interested. But to have a single council member able to veto something that you want to put on your agenda, that you think is important, or your council liaison, that's sort of taking a lot of your, I guess, authority away. That's something to consider. Thank you. Um, 
Good evening. I'm Dan Carson. I'm a former Davis City Council member and worked on an, uh, both a city commission and a task force for a number of years. So I've got nine years city service and I very much agree with the, the concerns you just heard. Um, there's several concerns we have even with some of the changes that have been made. This is the third version of this since August 29 uh, that's been tweaked and that uh, op-ed that we, we shared with you, we still have the same basic concerns that we, we raised with you earlier. Um, uh, this takes away your independence. This is a very large concern. The current city commission handbook, which is an official city document, says you get to take any issue you want directly to council without any screening, uh, without any barriers. Um, uh, this proposal as written, and there's not much language here, uh, gives no time limit for this independent review to occur. So there's such the concept of a pocket veto. The power to delay is the power to deny. If you hold up a budget proposal past when the budget is adopted, it's a dead letter. Um, there's no constraints on any reason. The council has established a charter for each commission, just rewrote yours, and says, here's what you have to work on. But other than that, you should have free reign to work on those things that are within the charter without having to go to someone with a mother may I. Um, a one or two council member decision um, is not a majority. The Brown Act specifies very clearly that for there to be a governmental decision, which could include allowing a policy to move forward or to not move forward, either way, requires notice to the public, a chance for them to participate, um, and it requires meetings and decisions to take place in public. This review process will not exclude uh, other parties who want to lobby that single council member or two if it's a matter of interest to them that can all happen behind closed doors. Um, there are great alternatives. It's a, it's a great idea to try to improve, to get the council and commissions more collaboratively on the same page. We have proposed, Elaine and I, that you go back to two things this council was doing only recently. One of those things is that when we, the council was writing its two-year new set of goals, they reached out to each of the commissions, both for ideas to include, but also to get their feedback and reaction to goals that are included in that document. Um, I personally, when I was liaison to Finance and Budget Commission, grabbed quite a number of items that were on their list and worked them right into that official city document. That seems to have stopped. The other proposal as an alternative is that you um, the, uh, I'm up past my bedtime. Oh, public workshops. We had a routine where each month council met in a workshop with one of its commissions and basically went over its work plan and got on the same page. Each month we do another commission. There's fewer commissions now, so that ought to go more quickly and allow for more frequent collaboration. So there's ways to do this that don't intrude on public uh, input um, and will achieve the goal that they want. That's my point. Thank you. All right, do we have any other public commenters? Okay. All right, seeing none, let's discuss. Can we actually bring up the infographic again? So I guess I kind of wanted to understand a little bit 
you know, it would have been helpful if we could have seen this is how it's done now, and this is how we're proposing it to be done, and these are the reasons why. You know, that we're going to you know, have more what efficiency, we're going to you know, make sure that uh, we're, uh, the commissions are not you know, burdening, I don't know, the staff with requests for information or research. Um, but if it is something like that, then there are ways to address that without necessarily having to change um, kind of the process that's currently in place. Um, you know, there can be parameters around uh, requests that are made for information and limits placed on um, you know, what, what's passed to the city staff. So, um, which, you know, could then put more uh, burden on the commission, but if they feel strongly about it, then it seems to me that that could be, um, you know, shows up that the issue is worthwhile. I guess the first thing I also, the other thing I also was thinking is that it felt like it was diminishing the role of the commission and that in some ways some of the rethinking and, and issues that might come up that, um, you know, are drawn from all of the different topics that we're having to do. So that, that felt like there was a loss there. Yeah, Kelly, could you clarify, do you know, um, could you uh, speak to what the rationale was behind the change? I mean, this isn't so much of a change for us, except for C, um, but what was the rationale? Was it for uniformity, for efficiency, for? Sure. Um, so, yeah, just, just to explain, A and B, if you look at the chart, A and B are changes. Yeah, that's how things are done now. Um, C is not consistent across commissions. So different commissions do it in different ways, and uh, you, therefore um, there's not there's not that consistency there. We were looking for some sort of consistency so that you know all commissions have the same type of I'll call it communication back and forth with the, the city council. Um, so we consider that to be a an, an issue or a problem. Um, you may not, but uh, we want everything to be equitable across all of our mini commissions. It's, uh, it, it helps all of us to operate more clearly and then know what the expectations are. Does that answer yes. your question? Thank you. All right. Commissioner Just to echo your uh, question also, is, I'm just curious, it seems, it seems like there are perhaps other ways to accomplish that too. I can understand that. Uh, the need, you know, for equity across and consistency, and also just alignment with the council work plan. And I'm just wondering if other alternative solutions were considered, or what some of them might be. So we we didn't have you know ten or twenty different solutions that we were uh, discussing, but um, we were trying to figure out some way within our sort of current structure. Um, that information could be taken to the council from an advisory commission. Um, so yes, you're somewhat independent, um, but you are an advisory commission to the council, and have them review, um, or have somebody at least review what was being requested for a, a project, or a, I call it a task or a project. Um, you know, there, there are, different options of some variation of this flowchart. Um, you could cut out uh, staff, council liaison, council subcommittee, and just simply say, everything that the commission wants to add goes to the council and council decides. You could say, we don't want council to do any of that, and we'll simply tell the council um, what we've decided that we're going to do. Uh, and that can be transmitted via minutes or uh, through some other mechanism. Um, there are probably all kinds of gradations in between. Um, this proposal was put together because we felt it struck the right balance of um, having, a, you know, allowing a, a commission to brainstorm and discuss ideas and, and put forward ideas and still have the council involved in some you know, capacity. Um, one of the things that we do want to guard from, this goes to the question of you know, are there problems, if a commission were to spend a lot of time 
on some topic that was not at all of the interest uh, of interest to the council, um, you could end up in a situation where the commission is frustrated that they spent time on something, the council is frustrated that maybe other things weren't being um, addressed, and so we're we're just trying to make sure that that mismatch is not there. And if I can answer just a, or just a couple of things. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the comment about the time limit, and the intent was for this to be you know, relatively immediate. So you bring something up at one meeting, uh, staff liaison, council liaison, discuss it between that meeting and the next meeting, so that by the time you've got the next meeting, you know what your answer is. Um, there is not an intent to, or a plan, to uh, decide that who we don't like that idea, we're just going to not talk about it for the next nine months. So I didn't want to clarify that. It's not really in the flow chart, but we were trying to keep the flow chart to one page if the white loan is successful. All right. All right. Any other comments? Mayor Chapman? Yes. So for new commissioners, Mayor Chapman is our liaison, as you know. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mayor Josh Chapman. I'm sorry I was a few weeks late. I was dropping the kids off at sports. Welcome to the new commissioners. It's nice to see you uh, in person and not over Zoom. So thank you for uh, your service to our community, much like Kelly. Uh, I don't spend much time standing on this side of the podium, so it's a different view. And I uh, appreciate being, being here. I was sitting there. Nothing was up, set up here today, so usually I am sitting down here and wouldn't be coming up to talk to you at this podium or at this lectern, so it's a little different side. But I do want to address a couple things. One, uh, to Commissioner Lickenberg's uh, question, around why we're doing this. Um, if you look at the, in the staff report, uh, the very beginning of it talks about and is laid out why uh, this, this process was undertaken, where it describes uh, some frustrations that we experienced. Um, we, we used to do, and I hopefully we'll bring them back, we had um, uh, city council and commission uh, meetings. So we'd be like an hour before council meeting, uh, we get together and have conversations around the work plan, checking what's going on, how the commission's doing, what's working, what's not working. One of the things that came up routinely through those conversations was frustration around how, what do you want us to do, right? How do you want us to put things on the agenda? We do something and then we, we send it up to you and then you don't want anything to do with this, right? So we were trying to find a way to say, look, here's a process that we can put in place that allows commissions to come, come forward with an idea, bring it through some sort of a vetting process, if you will, um, and have the conversation uh, with the staff, with liaisons, with the chair, um, and then bring that to myself and my colleagues for consideration. Um, as uh, one of my former colleagues who's here this evening mentioned and wrote in his op-ed, but if you look at this last uh, column chart on the right, it says, right, recommendation goes to city council for review with staff analysis. So saying that it's gonna be one council member has the ability to kill this idea or put it away is not true. If you look here, no matter what, it's going to come to city council. Anyone can pull that off, show off the lawn or off the uh, consent calendar and have that conversation and say, hey, I didn't see in our packet that the Social Service Commission described X and it was not recommended by the liaison and staff to discuss that. Can we talk about that, right? And that's the time for the rest of the council to have that discussion. So um, the notion that this is somehow uh, going to be a power play, uh, I think one is just a uh, is trying to sow some distrust in the process that we have, uh, but also is just uh, not true. Uh, the second part, I think, is what we have here, and this comment was made about different versions of this, and that's exactly what we were trying to do. Um, we received feedback in the original uh, commission process that there wasn't, they, they wished there was more engagement, right? And that's what this is, and you're absolutely right. There are different versions of this, and there have been edits made, and that's the process that we want to see happen. We want to come to you, give us feedback, you love it, you hate it, you want a, a, an explicit timeline in there, fine, let's figure that out, put a time, whatever that is for you, um, for coming forward from this commission, that myself and Vice Mayor you know, Vitalik, who are the two that are working on this, are gonna take into consideration before we bring this back to our council. So this is the, is the process, right? This is our way of getting feedback from every single commission and saying, what do you like about this? What don't you like about this? Um, but the vast majority of what you see here as um, assistant, um, City Manager Sackwood said A and B are all the same, and that's where a lot of that workload comes from. Um, lastly, I think we see um, how well and how powerful commissions are 
when they're doing the tasks that are set up. So I think if you look at the reimagining public safety piece, right, that was a huge um, effort that came forward that we asked commissions to do. We came forward, we have the department that Dana is now the head of, um, was direction from council, hey, we want you to do this, right? It was meaningful, it was impactful, it was powerful. Um, work that you guys have done here on this commission, you said we wanted an inclusionary housing ordinance, right? Tackle this for us, give us this information, because staff is overworked, they don't have enough time to do it, we need you to do this work so it can come to us already vetted, right? That's the important work that needs to happen. Not that ideas that come from this commission or other commissions are not important, but we want to make sure that your time is well spent, and that's one of the pieces that we heard over and over and over again from commissioners was, they felt like their time was being wasted. And we saw a huge amount of turnover in commissions for people who were in these really long meetings or in meetings that then, that when those pieces came forward, it never came to the city council. And that's where some of this frustration lies. We spent all this time doing it, and you're not even looking at this. So we want to get a process in place that continues to empower commissions to do the work. We want to make sure it's, it's work that you, that is, is valuable to your commission and is also valuable to the council um, and fits into the work that we're doing as a whole. So, Happy to answer any other questions. Uh, thank you again for looking at this, uh, looking at this here this evening. I'll sit over here now. So one thought I thought about this process is what we do for our commission, and I feel like some of the strengths are if we think about the council work plan, if we think about the goals that we set as a commission. And I think that in conversation with the need for the upcoming calendar, we try to stay within the purview. And I feel like there's already a consensus of kind of staying tight to what we're mandated to do and, and not trying to, to go beyond that. And so I don't know if that just seems commonsensical, but it seems like that's what we're doing without necessarily requiring a, a kind of a check outside of that. Um, and I can see if, if another commission is, is not trying to do all that alignment internally that it would potentially require something like that. But I think for for the way that we've been working, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's necessary to that C on the right section. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, in the staff report and in what um, what Kelly said, sorry, Assistant City Manager Sekowitz <laughs> and Mayor Chapman shared, um, the term undue resources. That's a lot of time, undue resources, staff time. And that, when I think through it, that sounds like maybe that is the problem we're trying to solve. Because I, I agree with what my fellow commissioners shared. I can't think of a project or a task that we've set out to do other than when we wanted to do a higher amount of public engagement and we wrote a public engagement plan. That didn't work, did not pan out. And there was a lot of discussion around it, it was a struggle, but we had communication about it, right? And so I, I wonder, and I wonder if you could clarify, what are the types of resources that we can expend on subcommittees, and where does it go out of bounds when it becomes burdensome to staff? That might help. So when we're talking about resources expended, there are two primary types of resources. One would be uh, actual dollars. Um, so you, you know, want to commission a study that does X, Y, or Z, and we have to hire a consultant and it costs as much, et cetera. Um, that would be something that would be a resource allocation that most likely would be outside of your um, uh, authority to require. Um, and we would go to, depending on the amount, go to either the department head or maybe the city manager or um, depending on the amount, again, maybe the council. So there's already a process for that in place and amounts and things like that that would be taken into consideration, but that would be something that um, would be a resource allocation. The other one would be simply staff time. Um, our general rule, well, you know, uh, commissions don't direct staff. You've probably heard that from me or from Dana before. Um, and that's not meant as a, uh, you know, a, a threat or trying to make anybody frustrated. But we have work that we're supposed to be doing. And if there is something that the commission is requesting that is going to take extensive staff time, then um, we need to see if we have the bandwidth to do that. Now, in some cases, you may ask for something and say it's something for the social services and housing department. 
And Dana may say, no, this is actually something we need to be doing, and I'm going to you know, adjust the resources that I have. The staff is going to work on that, and all is well. It may be something that is completely aside and separate from the work that Dana's limited, limited staff have, limited on the numbers, not the talent, um, have to, uh, to work on. And in that case, she may say, I can't afford to have these people spend time over here on this, um, more than maybe a couple of hours. Uh, and she may say that this is something that um, you know, she, she can't uh, authorize on, you know, without other kinds of, uh, without something else. So those are the two types of resource allocation that would be most common. Does that answer your question? Or whose question was it? I don't even know. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does, but I wonder about the, the difference between that and then it being allowed, because it, it says here, place tasks, items on commission agendas. Because items could be about discussion, right? It could be, we form a subcommittee of three of our members, and we're going to set a number of goals, right? And then if there's a gap in between, where then it has to go for the approval cycle, and then we won't hear until the next meeting that, yes, you have permission to do that subcommittee project that doesn't require any staff time because you three are going to handle it and you're going to talk to outside experts, right? Because that's distinctly different from what I'm hearing there. I never imagined that we ever have the authority to say we have to do a study and it's going to cost $100,000. That sounds so far beyond what we have been um, given in our charter and in when we, when we take this position. Um, but most of the things that we request are, we would really like to look into, or we'd like to hear from, okay, no, here's a better example. This year, we each established our liaison approach where we reached out and met with um, nonprofits. And that was hugely beneficial to us, right? And it was pretty time sensitive. We had a schedule, we were assigned, we went through it, we gave reports. Imagine the delay if, and that did take staff time too, right? But imagine the delay if we jog that back and explain the project multiple times and have multiple checkpoints. I worry about the loss of good work from talented people who want to volunteer and not take city resources, but contribute our time as a resource. So how is that reflected? How can that be captured? Because I don't want Dana staying up all night because I've asked her a question, right? That is definitely inappropriate. We need to protect staff time, but there's got to be another way to do it that doesn't mean we sacrifice our ability to do subcommittee work. Just to add to that really quick, I was curious, does this limit our ability to make motions and form subcommittees? Because one thing is we say, let's form a subcommittee motion, I, okay, we formed it. And this other issue seems to be about, now let's put discussing this on the agenda. What's the difference between our ability? Yeah, and this, to do these that? are good questions and the type of input that we're looking for. You know, what, where are the things where, based on your experience and what you do, it, it doesn't make sense or we need to clarify or think about. So, um, in thinking about what you just asked, uh, if, the, if the commission wanted to create a subcommittee to go and look at something, um, it may be that the staff liaison is able to say right then and there, or with the council liaison, yeah, that makes sense, go off and come back to the next meeting. Um, there wouldn't, in that case, be a delay. Uh, if it turned into a bigger project than that, then we would still, I think, in this proposal, want to take that information to council. It may be with the recommendation that, hey, this is what they're doing, go forward. Um, it could be with the recommendation of this is what they wanted to do and we're not you know, not recommending it any longer. Um, that would then need that, that full council um, approval. So to your point though, it depending on how it was structured, it could take an extra meeting for you to have that subcommittee and then you have authorization to do that. So that's something that I think you would want to 
take into consideration. I do think that's a key part, is I, I think that there's something here about the um, output of resources by the city in terms of staff time and money. And I can understand that that is an issue that we need to address. But there's so much of our commission work that results in pushing conversations forward because we went out and got information. We connected in some way with, with our neighbors. We reached out to a nonprofit, right? We did research on our own and worked together. And that, I think, is the spirit and lifeblood of what can, makes commission productive and contributing to our community. So, um, so I worry that the current structure could get in the way of that. And I, I would suggest that we find a way to modify the chart so that it's about this resources question and not simply <coughs> tasks or agenda items, but about whether or not we're asking for an outlay of city resources. Because that seems like a very legitimate thing for review. Yeah, I have a couple of comments too. I mean, I actually want to, to add on to that. I mean, I think this is hard for us because our commission functions so well. I mean, we do. I mean, it has been many, many years since we've had something way off in left field that wasn't part of our charter. And I think um, this does make sense in that we have created subcommittees that the council had a subcommittee on. Pacifico is our example. We did not need to have our own. We didn't need to have, we had two. Yeah. No, and, but at the same time, we did. The, we had a subcommittee on inclusionary zoning. And since the, that the staff didn't have the bandwidth to do that, you know, we did that. Um, but at the same time, I met with um, uh, Mayor Chapman and um, Council Member Whitelock a year and a half ago. Um, and every single chair said the same thing. We want to do work that is meaningful and impactful. And I think that this does allow, I mean, I, I think our commission is different. I think we function very, very well. But I think perhaps for some other commissions, it might be that there needs to be a vetting process. Um, I think that vetting process needs to be, I mean, I think there's always a vetting process because we know that we, uh, we work here to serve um, the council. We serve our council and our community. Um, but we, if something is well within our purview and it's non-controversial, I don't want to limit our ability to be nimble. And I think that's what Judy is talking about, some time-sensitive issues. We haven't had anything that's uh, controversial. But I think, I think this is um, you know, worthy of, of discussion. I think it's a, a good um, plan, and we want to send you back with some good feedback. Um, but I do worry about the um, inhibiting the ability for us to create something. I think that would be a significant, significant hindrance for this group. And the, that just as far as part of the process, I feel like you know we always have staff. We often have council representatives at the meetings when we're saying what we want to put on future calendars. And so I feel like there is that check-in with kind of capacity and if it seems like it's going the right direction uh, already when we're in the meetings. <laughs> And I think um, you've done a great job in, in rewriting our, our charter. And I think that, you know, though we have those guardrails, I think that helps keep us, keep it in balance. I mean, stuff that's way out on left field, we're not going to, we're not taking it up. Thank you. I do, I do appreciate that a lot. <laughs> okay. So. All right. Any other, do we have more questions or comments? Oh, okay. Please. Yeah, one other point. Um, just a point of clarification, I guess, on the flowchart. I stickler. I love flowcharts, um, but I, the language is confusing me because a lot of people are talking about um, concern of centralization and the longer process of, of requiring city council approval for agenda points. If I follow, so if I look at C and I go to the second point, which says review by staff slash council liaison to commission or council subcommittee. If I read, I'm reading that slash as an or, which maybe that, that that's the mistake, but the review by staff. Okay, we go to staff to the commission or, or council subcommittee. So it could be reviewed by the staff just to the commission. They could recommend approval. And then if you just go on the left side, then it's just sending that information to city council, which is, sounds like an FYI. Um, am I misreading that? That, that seems like the, then the staff, uh, city staff, have kind of whatever veto authority on agenda points and not city council. But am I misunderstanding? No, I don't think you're misunderstanding. Um, that would be the sort of first line of review. Uh, is this does this fit the purview of the commission? Is there are the resources available? Um, et cetera. Um, if there is a council subcommittee that's already been designated by the council, 
then that that trumps staff and um, the, the council liaison. But if there's already a council subcommittee that is on that particular topic, then the council has already said we want we are de we are deputizing those two council members to kind of carry whatever that topic is forward, and that council subcommittee would then work with the commission to get to ask them to do whatever that they wanted them to do on that topic. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It would probably be helpful to have another box then, like if... Yeah, we have another box. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were talking but about... If there's not a council subcommittee that doesn't go... You, it's, it would be, it, this proposal would have it be staff and the council liaison making that first, um, that first run out of And or? or? It would be and. Okay, so, so that's the slash I thought was more. Okay. So the slash is awkward replaced. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, One more question then, building on that, and thank you for clarifying the slide a little bit more. Does that mean that the review and approval could happen with us in the meeting? We say, we want to have a subcommittee. City staff, can you take a moment and review if we want to have a subcommittee? Mm -hmm. And you could take a moment and we could say, great. We're putting on the subject where it doesn't have that gap unless there's an outlet of resources involved. So it could, we right. haven't decided any of that yet. Right. So okay. what I heard pretty clearly from you, and I saw some heads bobbing, so I'm assuming you've got some <laughs> consensus, is that there's interest in that so that it doesn't cause that delay of you mean you can you can do some work between one meeting to the next rather than having to wait and leave for all the meetings. Seeing more head yeah. So I, I feel like if we're um, operating, there there is already this communication that we have um, because we have um, parameters that are presented to us from the council about what our um, you know, what our what our um, goals are, um, objectives are. Um, it, it seems to me, and then there's the Burden on staff. Um, so there, there are all the, there seem to be these clear parameters that we can work in, and then things that just fall outside of those that can kind of guide maybe the need for the other commissions. I'm, I may be repeating myself, but it's, it just seems like there's already some structure um, and a shared concern about staff overload. That may already be protecting, and that may be specific to this commission. I don't know, this is my first day. Um, <laughs> but uh, this, yeah, that just could be clarified if this goes on to additional levels of analysis and review. I appreciate that, and it's actually really great to have commissioners who have been through some meetings before and commissioners who are looking at this with a fresh set of eyes. So both sets of perspectives will make for better better information and better outcomes. And having freshly read all of the content and so like being newly onboarded, I feel like... Do you feel like this is your amazing? amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Right. Thank you. No, can I just... Yes, oh, I, do I need to go? So I think just in, in close, thank you. Um, and I think what Assistant City Manager uh, Kelly Sackowitz mentioned at the very beginning um, <laughs> was that this does, and what the discussion that you just had further uh, exemplifies that it, it's different for every commission, right? I don't know in the other commission uh, meeting that I was in around this, the subcommittee piece didn't come up, but that's something that this commission does a lot of, right? You guys have a lot of subcommittees, you form your subcommittees, you, well, you do a lot of work in that area. Um, so that's exactly the point of us coming here to do this, was to get it, because it's not the same for all. There are other commissions, the Planning Commission, doesn't, that doesn't really apply, right? And it's, it's just, that's not what they do. Um, and then there are some commissions where this really is going to be more foundational to the work that they do. Um, and it varies from commission to commission. So I just wanted to say that this is what we were hoping for, was to get some of this back, because I don't know if, with the one that you've been in, if that subcommittee piece has come up before. Right? And it's a great point. And that's the last thing that we want to do is hinder a commission from doing the work that, that doing the good work that you do. So um, thank you again for uh, a thoughtful discussion. And um, we've taken all this back. We have another few weeks of, of feedback from commissions and uh, we will uh, bring things back. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions or comments? All right. Let's move on. Okay. Affordable housing.
one program, your objectives. Okay. Back again with some information for affordable housing. Just wanted to kind of go over some goals um, of what we as a department would like to do and in moving initiatives forward with respect to affordable housing in the city of Davis. So, with that being said, one of the things is um, how does the SSH, uh, Social Service and Housing Affordable Housing Goals, align with the city council goals? Um, with shoring up the housing continuum, um, reviewing various housing models to determine what supports housing needs for the city of Davis, examine what funding sources are available to support those housing needs, explore public and private development partnerships that will support increasing affordable housing units and developments within the city of Davis, improving social services for vulnerable population is another goal of the city council. We'd like to explore new services that will support vulnerable populations within the city of Davis and encourage st stakeholder engagement to support vulnerable populations. Um, one of the things I was hoping we could have a discussion about, well, one of the things we're hoping to have a discussion about tonight was where do we see the focus being with respect to affordable housing? Would it be on emergency housing, rental housing, affordable renting housing, shared ownership, equity, that's more along the lines of for sale housing, market ownership with down payment assistance. Those are the five areas, and unfortunately, probably can't do all of them at the same time, so it'd be good to kind of have a discussion surrounding what, what do we see the most important need being. What types of funding support affordable housing development? So you have three tiers, you have local, and then from the local perspective, you have general fund allocations that can help support affordable housing. You have housing trust funds that can support affordable housing. You have in lieu of fees that go to support uh, affordable housing. And you have impact fees. For, on the state level, you have HCD, Housing and Community Development Grant Opportunities. Uh, the various grants can, uh, are specific to different populations or different types of housing. You have emergency transitional funding, you have permanent supportive housing, and then you just have permanent rate affordable housing. And then at the federal level, there's um, various uh, grant opportunities that are not just home and CDB entitlement, entitlement opportunities, but those are the primary from the federal level. So for, um, for the federal funding, um, under AC, I mean under HUD, um, Davis is an entitlement city, so that means we get an allocation every year of home and CDBG funding that can help support um, affordable housing. And then there are opportunities to partner with the Housing Authority that could both support voucher assistance and project based assistance. And then other, again, various HUD funded grant opportunities. At the local funding level, we have the opportunity to, again, ask for general funding allocation support, um, the local housing trust fund, and with the local housing trust fund, it gives us the opportunity to apply for funding from HCD. We have a local housing trust fund, and we can then apply for um, funds from HCD. We actually um, just missed an opportunity with HCD that... Um, that on September 17th of last week, and we were not able to apply for it. We have in lieu of fees that we collect on um, projects that do not abide by our um, inclusionary zone requirement of 15%. In those instances, we should be collecting some level of in lieu of fees to support affordable housing. And then there should be some level of impact fee assessment associated with every development, new development in the city and we can ask for allocations from that to support affordable housing development. And then with state funding support, again, it's HCD primarily. Um, I know you guys heard about the conversation that was happening this, morning, this evening around Palomino. Um, in reviewing the affordable housing plan, 
I kind of figured out they're going to go for some level of public funding from the state. So again, whether that be tax credit, HCD, all those are state funding sources to support affordable housing. The um, other thing is exploring private-public partnerships. So anytime you have affordable housing development, there generally speaking is some level of local support. When we say local support, we mean some level of funding from the locality to support affordable housing. That local support then allows private partnership, private entities to go and be competitive to build what is known as their capital stack to support the affordable housing development. We would really like to start exploring those public-private uh, partnership opportunities by releasing a uh, RFQ that will bring about some interest from developers, not just local developers, but developers who are in the business of building affordable housing to then begin to explore possibilities of uh, infusing some level of affordable housing development in the city of Davis. Um, I give the um, example here that I'm not certain if any of you guys are familiar with Creekside, but um, fun fact with Creekside, uh, Creekside was a project that fell into my portfolio when I was an employee of ACB. It is a 100% um, a affordable housing development in the city of Davis, and it was done through a public-private partnership between the city of Davis and, and um, a local developer within the city of Davis. So with that, we are recommending that uh, we have discussions or get, get the uh, ability to, re to release an RFQ to explore public-private partnership with affordable housing developers. Retur we will return at a later date to the SSC Commission with a list of funding opportunities for this year. HCD, to give you an example, just released their um, 24, 25 calendar for all the funding opportunities for this year. So we'll bring back a listing of what funding opportunities we foresee coming within this fiscal period that we might have the opportunity to apply for funding. Um, and then our, our, our um, concentration, we believe, should, should go towards permanent supportive housing and just afford, uh, affordable housing residential units. I mean, we can, this is, this is good. Iris, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. You made a, a little side comment about there was a, something that we missed the deadline for. So I wasn't sure if that was because we weren't, like right now we're looking at what's ahead for this year. I wasn't sure if it, last year we didn't have enough time to get ahead or like we weren't eligible for something. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. So HCD just um, had a NOFA for funding support for your local housing trust fund. Um, we were not in a position to apply for it, so we were not able to submit the application for this funding cycle. Okay, so since I've been here, there's been conversations surrounding the housing trust fund. Um, so, when RDA, um, Redevelopment Agency, was in place, um, I think 2012, uh, the state stopped funding redevelopment agencies. When that happened, city could, there could be two successor agencies per county. Um, 
cities could determine whether they wanted to be successor agencies or whether the county was going to be the successor agency. The city of Davis at that time chose to be a successor agency. So within Yolo County, you have two successor agencies. It would be Yolo County and the city of Davis. So what that means for the city of Davis is we held on to all of our redevelopment assets. Redevelopment is funded at the state level, so if you did not want to be a successor agency, you had to turn the assets back over to the state. With that being said, um, you had two sources of funds that, well, you had, primarily you had four sources of funds for the city of Davis that supported redevelopment. Housing trust fund, tax set-asides, in lieu of fees, It's just a three. Okay, so it's just a three. Um, somewhere within the hodgepodge, there was some confusion, I think, around what housing trust fund is. So when I came in, there was conversations around surrounding some level of housing trust fund that's been privatized. But when I speak of housing trust fund, I'm talking about the housing trust fund that was supported through redevelopment. And the city actually has um, quite a bit of activity in their housing trust fund that um, somewhere got lost in translation. We're in the process of clearing that up right now so that hopefully we can start supporting some more affordable housing development. So that is the difference when you're hearing the external factors talk about the housing trust fund. Um, I think they're talking about this private um, funding stream that they're asking, I think, people to donate to. But when I speak of housing trust fund, I'm talking about um, the redevelopment agency's fund. And what it's the, the difference between the redevelopment agency funding, that came from the state, and then the funding that's in our community foundation fund. That's it with the Yellow County Community Foundation. And there's, they're two very different things. Okay, when we receive like the $500,000 that we're getting annually from Celeste, that lands in the city's fund, right? That should land in the city's fund. Right. Um, I've done <coughs> some research. I don't think I have it with me tonight. Um, I did some research to determine when affordable housing was actually established within the city of Davis. I don't have it with me tonight, but it was done in 1986 by resolution. I don't have it, I don't have it by heart right now. And that resolution established the affordable housing program for the city of Davis, as well as established the housing trust fund for the city of Davis. And at the time that the housing trust fund was established for the city of Davis, the in lieu of fees were the primary source of funding. Um, the city of Davis has applied and has received, I don't have the information right now, uh, some support from HCD or local housing trust fund as well. So um, the 100000 or that you're talking about those are considered in lieu of fees, mm -hmm. and those should go into the housing trust fund for the city of Davis, not the private housing trust fund. And those funds are all essentially restricted. It's kind of like a revolving home fund. The funds come in, and they're restricted. The, the purpose for reuse is restricted to a very specific affordable housing kind of development. So it's, it's if you have to be. Uh, the eligibility requirements for expending it. In the local fund, okay, so we call it the city fund and yeah. the local fund, right? That's where, okay. In the local fund, are there eligibility requirements upon that as well? Yes. Or, okay. So, so I'm stuff. sorry, wait a minute. Let's, let's make sure we're being clear. So, first and foremost, we really shouldn't talk about this private fund because it's really not regulated in the same fashion that public funds that are associated with the city's housing trust fund are regulated. So with the city's housing trust fund, 
that has been supported through redevelopment. There are only, I think, three permissible uses. One, and there are caps on two of the permissible uses. One is for uh, eviction prevention, somewhere along those lines. The other one is for uh, homelessness. I believe each one of those caps is 100,000. They might have changed it in July of this year to 250,000. I'd have to double check. 20% of the fund can be used for administrative purposes, with the remainder being used solely for affordable housing development. Um, I'm not too familiar with the Community Housing Trust Fund. I'm not too familiar with that Housing Trust Fund. Um, so I can't really speak on that one. I think that that was done because there was this misnomer of people thinking the city did not have a housing trust fund. Is there any reason why they're called the same exact thing? <laughs> well, I, again, I think it goes back to the external forces believing the city did not have a housing oh. trust fund. So I think that the external forces had done some research and saw what uses housing trust funds support and in that light, they felt like, okay, this would be a good idea for the city to establish a housing trust fund. Um, not understanding that the city already had a housing trust fund. Thank you. So, so I have a question. Um, you I guess, would it, would it make sense that, um, to see what those different streams or those different uh, pots of funds are and the restrictions that are associated with each of them when we're talking about you know, making a recommendation about exploring opportunities where we may have to, some of those resources may have to be tapped in order to get more resources to actually make the opportunity come to reality? So that is the goal is that we want to earmark those resources specifically for affordable housing development. Um, and primarily, that's the only thing they can be used for. Um, with respect to um, homelessness, I think that moving in the or we, we, we believe that moving in the direction of uh, affordable housing, the auspices that you build that that stream of housing that supports homelessness into your affordable housing model. So there would be no segregation, if you will, of that funding source because the deeper dive into the AMI level get to the homeless piece with state funding. Now, with respect to federal funding, there are federal funds that are earmarked strictly for homeless populations. So when we are using that stream, there will be a different, um, a different allocation and outcome for those funds. But with respect to the state funds, I think you can accomplish um, both permanent supportive housing, permanent housing, for various levels of AMI concerns that will address all of it. And from a department point of view, what we'll bring to you are things that are really in our wheelhouse. And when we're talking about affordable housing and affordable housing development, we're going to be talking about things that are tied to either our local funds, the state, or to the federal. And, and the funds that are made available in this arena. So it's it's what we kind of focus on is also restrictive and really narrow. Mm -hmm. um, so we, when we know that we've got specific rules that um, the state's housing and community development department set forth when we're talking about using public money to develop projects. So we have to look at all of those things when we're, when we're talking about developments. So for us, you know, they're, they do have requirements that um, may not show up in market rate development or private development, but will definitely show up in the affordable housing arena. So the questions that we have to ask 
before we either apply for funding or allocate funding to it. I guess I was just thinking it would be helpful to the new person to just see what resources the city has already to be able to kind of help parlay and give you other resources. That's all. And knowing that there's a certain responsibility that has to be fulfilled in utilizing those resources for the purpose that they have. So I think to answer your question, there are, I would say, three. Sources that are available to from the city level already for affordable housing. That is the local, which is the housing trust fund, as well as since the city of Davis is a successor agency, the funds that come back on the loans that have already been given out under RDA are available for use for affordable housing development too. As well as the in lieu of fees. Your resolution clearly indicates that the in lieu of fees are to support affordable housing um, development. And then the other one is CDBG from the federal level. CDBG and home can also go to support affordable housing development. So primarily, those are the sources of funds that you can know on an annual basis will come in to support affordable housing development. Now the amounts can tend to vary every year, but those are definitive funding streams that will come in every year. Um, there are other sources that might not happen yearly that also will go to support affordable housing development. I can tell you that this year, uh, HCD will be funding the National Housing Trust Fund. Can't remember the deadline, but that's something we want to look at because that could primarily go into a bucket to support affordable housing. Um, there are other, other streams of sources that come in too, they can go. Now when you talk about partnering with a private developer, or not necessarily private, but an affordable housing developer, they have other sources that they can go after competitively too, tax credit, um, the, the, the Section 8 program. The city wouldn't enter into those kind of agreements, but a developer would enter into those kind of agreements that would also support affordable housing development. With respect to tax credit, you're talking millions and millions of dollars that support affordable housing development. So a developer has can hedge the, um, the local support to get an equity investor to help support um, the tax credit piece of it. And for us, for the commission, what you've primarily been looking at are our CBG funds, the Community Development Block Grant funding, and the home funding. And CBG is restricted in that it can support services, mm -hmm. so it's it's all it supports the people that are in the program. So all the services that are serving the people, that's where your CBG money goes, your public services. There's a portion of it that can also go to um, making public improvements. So that's why we can do sidewalks and curb cuts, um, those kinds of things. That's what CDBG supports. Your home investment, though, really supports development. So that's why you get a chance to look at you know, development projects that come through and say, we'd like to rehab, or we'd like to, we're looking at acquiring. And that's what you can do with those home funds. So that's what's under our purview. And so that's why we look at those every year. But we also know that uh, the funding Streams are changing rapidly. Um, there are a lot of very different ones. There's a lot of new ones. Um, there's uh, uh, things coming out from the federal government, from the state, and we're looking at these things and trying to figure out, you know, what's going to be the most effective for Davis. Because when you hear about these giant pots of money, everyone goes, "Great, let's start applying." But then you have to look deeper at what are the restrictions. What does it take for us to, what, who will we have to partner with in order to go after this funding? Do we have the resources to support a project? Maybe we can get it built, but who's going to run the project? Who's going to provide the services to the project? Those are the kinds of things that we have to look at. So our department is really focusing on when we see projects that come across the board, we're looking at the affordable aspect first, because that's the only thing that's under our purview is the affordable aspect. 
And then when we look at that, we're looking at, so how is, how can we help this project come into fruition? And what is the developer doing to bring it to fruition? And what is, what are they looking for besides what we're considering the city seed money? Because that's what we have. We're not going to be able to support a giant development. But when we provide local support and we tell a developer, you have our support, they're going to take that support and go, okay, now I'm going to go talk to this other developer. I'm going to raise funds here. I'm going to use this mechanism here. So that's what our role is, is to do that research ahead of time so we can ask really pointed questions and make sure that they're fulfilling the eligibility and restrictive rules that we know are out there. So when we come back to you, then we can say that we've dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's. And yeah, this is a project that makes a lot of sense. And we can bring other people to the table. Yeah. All right. I have a question. Um, so earlier in the presentation, it said that one of the goals of the Department of Social Services and Housing is to explore new services for vulnerable populations, as well as affordable housing, obviously. I mean, I'm just curious about, you know, in the same way that you're exploring new avenues and uh, sources of funding from the state and federal to support affordable housing, I'm just curious about the possibility of doing the same to explore funding for more services. Is that, has that been in the conversation? Or is that a possibility? So, that's really Dana's well out, but really, um, to get at some of what you're saying is I think that when you start talking about permanent supportive housing, that's what you're really getting at with permanent supportive housing, is to make sure that we're supporting the housing with that aspect of permanent support. And that's kind of looking out there to see who the partners are that can provide that support with respect to housing. But I'll let me know. And, and that's, that really is because Remember, the city doesn't provide any direct services. Everything that we do is through contract. We do it with an agreement with a nonprofit or a, a person that's qualified to provide this level of service. So a lot of the funding that's coming out right now, it will say is this is restricted to a nonprofit uh, organization or restricted to um, a faith-based organization. Um, there's not a lot of funding that goes directly to uh, that for cities to apply for. And if it is available to us, usually what we'll do is we will have that money be more of a pass through. If we receive the funds, then we're going to do a competitive process to allow people to apply for it. So that's kind of how the CDBG process works, right? So we receive this entitlement from the feds. Once we know how much we're going to get, we let the community know that it's available and they can apply for that funding. They can tell us what kind of services they like to provide and they can tell us how it's going to strengthen the community. And the requirement is, the, at, at the base level, whatever they choose to do has to serve low, extremely low to moderate income people, and it's got to serve vulnerable populations. And so they have to tell us how they're going to do that. Um, and then once they tell us how they're going to do that, we'll hold them accountable in a scope of work to, you know, providing those services. So we do, we're often looking for funding opportunities. Um, a lot of times I'll see funding opportunities and I'll pass it back out to the community if the city's not eligible. But for the, the, the things that I know that um, we could be applying for, like our CDBG funding, like the you know, Yolo County Continuum of Care, which is called HPAC, the Homeless Poverty Action Committee, they have sources of funds that are available as well. We let them know when those competitions are coming up so they can apply for funding. Um, so like, for example, Paul's Place. You know, they, when HPAC releases its, um, when the continuum of care releases its funding opportunity, they apply competitively to receive that funding. And then they operate in, in Davis and maybe in some other places. But we always make sure that they're aware that funding is coming. We try to keep up <laughs> at this point because um, it, what we're finding is there are really large buckets of funds that are coming out but the restrictions don't make them an obvious choice for some place like Davis. Um, for example, uh, there's a large pot of funding uh, that's coming out that the county is applying for. It's called, uh, the states put it out, it's the encampment resolution funds. 
because the state wants us to address homeless encampments, right? So when I saw that, I was like, fantastic, that sounds great. But one of the requirements is when you speak, when you are engaged with a person that is unhoused, you have to be able to immediately offer them some form of housing in order to continue to engage with them. And at this point, we don't have that, but the county does. So you know that's why we're, we're looking at the details at some of this funding to make sure that um, we can be competitive, that we can meet the requirements, because what we don't want is for someone to turn around in two years and go, that's not quite what we were looking for. We'd like that money back. <laughs> that, that is not what we want to see. So um, we, we work together. Um, to try and, I, I, I always I laugh because I say, you know, I do people, and I was find the, the building, and you know, that's what we're looking for, how we partner to get the building built, and then once it's built, when the people come into the building, how are we supporting them? Who's going to support them, and for how long? Because uh, that's often an issue, too. All right, we have a lot to get through tonight still, so do we have any questions? Quick comments. Um, it's not, it's, it's not hopefully, quick. Oh, no, no, it's, it's quick. Yeah. Thank you for that macro overall look, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I just wonder where the housing trust fund number two fits into all that. Is it even part of this conversation at this point? I feel like it's a, a dangling limb. That's, <laughs> that's and, well, and I don't know what's going on with it. I'm just curious. It's I don't know what's going on with it either. <laughs> If you if if you if you look at um, that, so if you can imagine over the span of let's say twenty three years, you're talking roughly thirty million dollars that have been loaned out to various projects versus a fund that has maybe ten thousand. So the focus probably shouldn't be on that fund because you're talking about private donations to support that versus a machine that's already been built to support affordable housing. We just need to kind of concentrate on that and get that back into a healthy state so that we can start supporting affordable housing development. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, any other thoughts or comments that are very quick? Um, okay, what do you need from us? Do you need a motion? Mm -mm. No, nope. uh, feedback. Just we're looking for feedback. I okay, wanted to make you aware of what our goals were. Great. So. I would also like to propose a five minute break. Yes, yes, because we are going to be here. We're new members, we're not normally running this <laughs> but we're, It's going to be a late night. So you might want to call everybody. <laughs> Tell them to go to bed. Okay, so we'll re. What time is it? It's um, 9 04. So nine, at 9 10, maybe that's me. No, we have a bunch. We have um, this. This is going to take forever. I think I can roll through this pretty, pretty quickly. Okay. Though, so.
of the David Citizen Participation Plan, and I thought I'd tell you what it is. So every five years, Davis does what's called a consolidated plan. A consolidated plan is really letting HUD know what kind of plan Davis has for serving vulnerable people and for housing um, for the next five years. Um, so we do the Citizen Participation Plan as a component of that consolidated plan planning process, and we've just started the planning process for the consolidated plan. When we do that, we have to let the community know how they can engage in the process, and that's what this citizen's participation plan is. It just lets the community know um, why we're doing it, what a consolidated plan is, and where they can engage in the process um, out in the community and what the city's plan is to help them to engage. So, you know, we tell them that really we're just trying to figure out how we're going to meet housing needs and community needs, um, how we're going to come up with investment strategies for the funding that we do receive, and then what we're going to do to assist low and moderate income people, people that are at risk and vulnerable in the population, and how we're going to serve them with housing, with program services, and with infrastructure. And then we give them how they can participate in this process. So the first part of the process of the consolidated plan is doing a public hearing to let folks know there's a plan for the plan. Welcome to the government network. So there's a plan. Here's where you can find the plan. Here's where you can engage. And here's what it's going to look like, what engagement is going to look like for you. So. The city is working with a consultant right now, their RDA consultant. RDA helped us with our homeless strategic plan. So we asked them to help us with a consolidated plan, because the homeless strategic plan is also a part of our consolidated plan. So they are helping us to uh, create community forums. We're probably going to have one more community forum um, at the end of October, where we'll invite people to come out and talk about um, what they think uh, are things that we should be paying attention to in our consolidated plan. And then we're also going to have a series of um, focus groups uh, where we will go to uh, different venues that either serve people that are vulnerable or low income or where they live. Because we want to go and talk with folks about what their experience is, um, what, what's happening with them right now, what kinds of things are trending, what do they think is the most important thing that could be happening for them. Uh, and we'll also be co creating a community survey. RDA is working on some survey questions for us. We're going to throw a QR code on there and send that out broadly to the community. So if you can't make one of the forums, you can fill out the survey and we can get all of that information. And so once we advise people on how we're going to communicate with them, how they can engage, and where they can engage, and we start having these, this community forum, and we have our focus groups, all of that data will come back to RDA, and they'll help to assemble a draft of our consolidated plan. So the consolidated plan is due to HUD in May of 2025. So right now we're in the early process of this. Um, we're just notif notifying people that the process is underway, uh, this is how they can engage, and then the next step is completing the forums, um, uh, determining where the focus groups are going to happen, and then we'll be drafting plan. And once we draft the consolidated plan, I'll come back to you guys to look at first, and then we'll go to council. So that is why we've got your citizens' participation plan. Uh, this is the beginning. Uh, it's interesting because um, the last consolidated plan was in 2020. Lots happened <laughs> since 2020. The landscape has changed a lot. Um, and so we're really looking forward to actually going out into the community and 
trying to engage people that are having this lived experience and understanding where, where are the barriers, where are the gaps, um, what would you like to see happen. Um, and that will help council and the city better plan out what they want to do over the next five years. So that's my presentation. Citizens participation. Citizens participation. Do we have any citizens who would like to public comment? All right, seeing no public commenters. Oh, we have one? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's discuss. Okay, I have a couple things. Um, so I, first first of all, due in May of 2025, mm -hmm. that means this is going to overlap with the outreach with general plan happening at the same time in the city. Mm -hmm. um, what strategies mm -hmm. do we have for making sure that we that address works. that? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking with community development because they're responsible for the general plan. Mm -hmm. They will take our data and include it in the general plan. Okay. Because we're focused on very specific things. We're like I said, our focus is narrow. It's on vulnerable people and it's on low income people. So that's one component of the overall general plan. So it's okay. it's okay. later. That's good. I'm glad that, that you're already having that conversation about when we're gonna fly. Mm -hmm. Um okay, and then uh, I I know that we don't have any defined low or moderate income neighborhoods, but we've seen data over and over and over again about the vulnerability of our neighbors because they are housing burdened, right? So I'm wondering if instead of um, this second bullet, mm -hmm. um, you could use the maps that we have from our housing element mm -hmm. that show the census data of the neighborhoods that have the highest rate yeah. of individuals and families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and that's, that's, what, that's what RDA is doing right now. What they're doing is looking at the secondary data that's active. So they're looking at all the plans, they're looking at the maps that are out there, they're looking at the census, they're looking at that data. Um, what we're, what the department is focusing on is, okay, we, we know that this area has been considered low income, we want to go to that neighborhood and talk to the people that are there. So that's, that they're looking at the high level, where's the data out there, and we're looking at the, how do we engage with folks on a one-on-one. So we'll have both. Well, and what I think is that we have, especially in our rental community, folks who might be high income but still housing insecure mm -hmm. um, because of other variables happening in our housing market. And right, so I wonder if yeah. there's a way to reach that group. But we've gotten so much testimony from Stake and Pariolo about people who are holding two jobs mm -hmm. don't qualify. Yep. Right. Okay. And so. And it's, it's interesting because there's some data we know that it's kind of skewed. Like, for example, when we pulled, um, when we're looking at diversity in the city of Davis, some of that is really skewed by our student population. Mm -hmm. Student population makes us look like we're much more diverse than we actually are for the people that are living here. So that's something that we have to consider. Um, when we're looking at people that are rent burden, we focus first on uh, affordable housing because that's in our purview, but we will do focus groups in other uh, market rate locations to kind of invite that kind of conversation. What's happening with you? Because what we're looking at when we talk about the housing continuum, we are trying to address every little faucet of that housing continuum. How do we how do we connect with people all along? So, uh, so the part that we aren't going to redo is the piece of data that we got um, during the home strategic plan. Because there, we worked, we were looking at people that were at risk of homelessness and, and actually homeless. So we've got data there. So now we're moving a little higher up the ladder. We're looking at people that are in some form of permanent housing, and permanent supportive housing, and then it's market rate housing, and looking at what those impacts are. So that's where we'll be with this, with, with our consolidated plan, is that what we don't want to do is We've got one piece that's looking at the most fundamental level. We've already got that kind of looked at. Now we're going to look at that, that lower and middle area to see where the city can be engaging to. I have two more small ones. Okay, I'll go through them real quick. The city will make the meetings available to view online via Zoom, and social services is primarily the body based on this plan. So 
Um, we've been told many, many times that our committee meetings cannot be on Zoom. What's going to happen there? That's the community and I think it's forum. Great. Yeah. Okay. So okay. when we do our community forum, um, and our com we're hoping that we can complete our community forum on like a Saturday. So we or or sometime in an evening when people can get to it, it'll kind of work. Like you've seen other webinars, you can tune in and you can watch. Um, you can place comments in the chat, or we'll give you some place where you can provide feedback, but you won't be able to participate in the community meeting because then you can watch it, and you can. And that's how we're hoping to engage people, and that will be at the community forum, which will be a separate, a separate thing. We might want to specify the differences there because so much of this is based on our commission meetings and those, right? Like we, there's, look, we have child care yeah, available absolutely. here, right? Yeah. So I think that clarifying that would be important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I, yeah, that's, I think that's everything. I think that's everything. So thank you. Probably a federal requirement, but just a comment. I feel like, um, and maybe I don't know, we can use in our conversations, but I feel like the, the term citizen participation plan I don't agree with as much because it implies, I don't know, being a citizen city or being a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. and so, community participation plan or resident, you know, engagement plan or something. Um, I don't know if there's any way with, with naming, but. So, unfortunately, <laughs> these are HUD mandates. So, HUD tells us what our reports are that we have to, re that we provide back to them. So it's the consolidated plan, and it's uh, our action plan, it's our kind of consolidated annual performance and evaluation plan, um, and this is to the participation plan. So, and those are all prescribed, so we don't have any plans. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just in the ethos, then maybe. <laughs> but that's but but I take your point. But that's something that when we're having our focus groups and our forum, that's something that we can um, when we're doing outreach, we can make sure that people understand what that means and that we're looking for all voices and we're not looking to provide barriers to yep. participation in any way yep. um, to the community feedback. That we want. Yeah. So we can clarify that. Great. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think I, I love the focus group discussions and the survey as well. Just wondering how we can um, increase the number of those focus group discussions and the, the spread of those surveys as well. Um, will there be paper surveys as well? You mentioned the QR code and the, right. will there be like paper surveys and kind of enumerators going out mm -hmm. proactively collecting? So the goal at this point is uh, to publish information, the first point is to publish it on the city's website, um, put it out through social media, to send it out to the various mailing groups that we know we have without, within the city so that you know we can have others help push the message out. Um, we will provide paper surveys. We're looking at door knockers. Um, so we can kind of, especially in those areas that we know are, are lower income, a door knockers so we can encourage people's participation. Um, but those those are the means that we have right now. Yeah, and related to door and, and means, um, I don't know, is it possible at all to work with um, local community groups, uh, Interfaith Housing Justice, or Howard Davis, like to support in either door knocking or just in public group Absolutely. Um, discussion? Like, yeah, a lot of motivated volunteers there potentially. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. Is we, when we have all these materials developed, is we'll be doing outreach specifically to our providers, to the faith-based community, to let them know that this opportunity exists, and to encourage their uh, congregations and neighbors and all the people that they know um, to participate. Um, we know that everybody can't show up in person, so that's why we want to have a survey that's available that can be distributed. Um, and so we can get that feedback that, that way as well. But we will be, once it's done, um, we'll do a direct outreach. The city's got a listserv of all of the community organizations that it works with. 
Um, we go work with our continuum of care, the regional one too, and say, hey, can you publish this on your website so that you know we can spread it broadly. If we if we can talk to about you know putting it on Sac Steps Forward website because we've got people that read back and forth so that they can get that information too. So whatever venues or areas that you guys know of, we're happy to take that feedback and, and try and get this app right. Other comments or feedback? All right. Yeah, there's a mention here about about there's a mention here about the staff doing research about the Asian languages that might be needed to potentially update materials for the Asian Pacific um, Islander speaking populations. And mm -hmm. um, we were just curious about what that is like or what's going on with that. So what we're doing right now is working with a translation service that's kind of helping us to look at what the primary languages are in the city of Davis and helping us to determine how we can get the materials translated in, in the proper way um, and different avenues that, where we can distribute this information where people that uh, would avail of it would be able to get a hold of it. So. Um, we're working with a consultant to help us to do that because we don't have the means to do that. That's great. Is that the first time that the city's um, hired tonight to? No, I, I know that we've done it for uh, other activities, like when um, Davis, uh, it was right before I got here uh, during COVID, and you had the big push for uh, vaccinations, and you worked with UC Davis on that. Uh, there was a, a venue that they, there was a platform that they used to do that. So that's one of the methods that we're looking into. We're looking at how, we, how do we do it in the past. Um, we're also looking at, uh, from when we reached out to the county on what the major languages were um, in Davis, um, there's a big difference between communities. Um, what we found was in West Sacramento, uh, the primary language is English, Second was Spanish, third was Russian, you know, which is new. Um, and then in Woodland, I think they said that it was English, Spanish, and Farsi. So we're trying to determine what's happening here in Davis, um, and what are the primary languages, and how, how broad can we reach. So uh, that's why we're working with a consultant to help us to, to narrow that down. That's great, thank you. All right, any closing comments? All right, move on. Paper. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, the caper is a part of Davis's consolidated plan. And really, it's two things that you're looking at every year. At the beginning of the year, uh, and it's a fiscal year, so we start July through June. At the beginning of the year, we're telling HUD what is it we plan to that's our annual plan. This is what we think we're going to do with our funds. Here are the people we, we plan to, we intend to fund um, to do all these services. This is what we think is going to happen. The CAPER is the end of your report. Here's the performance of all of the people that we, you know, we funded. Um, did they meet their metrics? Um, did they see any trends? Um, what were the demographics like? What, what, what happened? So uh, we do have a draft paper right now. We are still, it's in draft because we're still compiling information from a lot of our, um, our organizations. We're asking, we, we, we ask them to provide us information quarterly on who they're serving so that we can kind of see how they're doing. And so we're just, we've gotten their fourth quarter reports. Now we're consolidating that data and taking a look at it um, and reaching back out to some of them to get clarification on it. So we've got this draft report right now. But essentially what we've done, is, what we know for sure is that we had $667,000 in CDBG funds to spend. And for we distributed that to eight organizations and they worked on 12 different projects. And of those um, in the public services arena, and that's the arena where the programs and services are, they serve 899 unduplicated individuals between the eight organizations. 
Um, and then with our public facilities funding, we, we started work and have completed work on two public facility projects. So we're getting the details on that now. Um, we do know that the $414,000 in home funds, that's the funds that we can use to develop affordable housing. Um, we've gotten that into contract with a developer for um, a project called Bretton Woods, but they haven't started yet. The market rate portion of that is um, underway, um, but they haven't yet started using the funds for the affordable housing portion yet. Home funds, you have a little longer to expend because um, the construction projects take longer. You usually have between about five and six years to spend. So we're still early in the project. So uh, like you can see, I put this little graphic because it makes it kind of easier to think about. It's when you're doing your consolidated plan, you tell the pillar like how they can engage. And then during the, plan, the creating the plan, we're assessing needs and we're coming up with a strategy. And then every year after that, we create an annual plan that says, okay, the first year of the consolidated plan, we're going to do that. And then at the end of that year, we tell them how we did, and then we start all over. So they're expecting you to kind of make adjustments along the way. But the con plan is the guiding force behind all this. Okay. All right, public comments. Any public commenters? All right, seeing none, let's discuss. Commissioners have any comments or questions about our consolidated? No? That is the fastest ever. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was leaning back. I was like, I, was, I know. <laughs> that is not. I know. Okay. Does okay. someone else have something? Uh, yes. Please, oh, okay. please, please, please. Um, yeah, I, I like the numbers and the metrics as well. It's, um, so look at those 19 different metrics and 19 goals that you listed up um, in that first table there. Um, it looks like maybe, like you said, it's draft, so it's still underway. There's you know blank spots as well. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like about nine of the goals kind of met their expected value or exceeded greatly. Mm -hmm. Some of them greatly exceeded. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing I'm curious. Do you have any personal reflections on like, yeah, nine? You know, we're the meeting seems like a lot of goals for for. For not a lot of, um, yeah, it seems like a lot of goals, and so it's hard to accomplish all of them. Yeah. Um, but do you have any personal reflections on, yeah, looking through those metrics and what was achieved and not achieved? So, in, in looking at it and in talking with the organization, I, one thing that I remind folks is that it's the amount of funding that we're providing to these organizations to do this work is really low. It's just that simple. Um, and the way that we look at it, like I said before, the city's money is seed money. It just says, the city has confidence in us, so they gave us some funding. And they can take that kind of award and wave it in front of foundations and other people that can help to bring them more, more funding. Um, but what we're finding with our organizations is it's harder to get funding. Um, the funding funders are narrowing what is expected of organizations to do. There's a real focus on, well, you know, homelessness is an issue, so we're going to put all our eggs in that basket and some other things that are not being considered. What about prevention? What about health? What about other things? So our, our providers are struggling with that because they're doing all of these things. And what they're, they're finding is that their funding isn't stretching as far, is one thing. And two, their capacity is, capacity is tough right now. Um, staffing levels are lower. Um, their staff is being poached by other organizations that have signing bonuses or they're looking to kind of provide incentives that a little nonprofit just can't provide. Um, so, uh, staffing and capacity is an issue. And I think all of them are struggling with, um, most of the agencies that we funded this past year are working in the housing arena, in, in services or um, in providing housing. Um, and what they're seeing is the trend is 
people are in more acute situations than they had before. And there are other things that are layered on top of the stress from trying to maintain their housing, so they're seeing more mental health issues. They're seeing people with more um, health issues in general, um, and they're trying to adapt to that. Um, and then there's new programs that are out there. There's a really large health program um, that the state has incentivized called CalAIM, and that's really to kind of incentivize getting people tied to health care. Well, that's disrupting a little bit about how uh, some of our service providers have provided you know, their, their services. So there's a lot of adjustment happening right now. Um, a lot, some of it is just adjusting after coming out of COVID, and what do we look like, and what are we doing, and who do we have to do it with, and then trying to adjust to this new reality. So that's what we're seeing when we're seeing these, this performance reporting. And one of the things that we asked for in the, in the report, besides the metrics, is what trends are you seeing? You know, what, what, what's impacting you? What do you see on the horizon? So we're, those are the things that they're telling us. And that is informing you know, what, what should we be looking at this coming funding cycle do we need to make adjustments? Thank you, Commissioner Rainer, for asking the, the big question first, because <laughs> my questions will pale in importance compared to that. Um, so um, I, have, I have one from the top. This covers the program year, July 1st, 2023, to June 30th, 2024, right? Yes. Okay. So I have a global edit then. Because I think there's a number of dates in here that are from outside of program year. Mm -hmm. And there were some big events that happened in our program year that didn't show up in the draft. Okay. And the biggest one that I wanted to point out mm -hmm. was is the respite center. Mm -hmm. Because in January the contract changed for the respite center, mm -hmm. but this whole report referred to communicare. So I think we need to have some sort of paragraph. So here's why it's not in there. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we you didn't know fund it with CPG. The only thing I report to HUD is what we did with our entitlement funding. That okay. funding is a different source. So I'm using funding for program year 24-25 at the respite center to make repairs. So that will be in the 24-25 report. But for 23-24, we didn't fund anything at the respite center. The funding that we got for the respite center was, I believe it was home mark. Yeah, homework. Homework. And that's not a part of this report. It, okay. That's thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. That does make sense. Mm -hmm. Um we still refer to the rest of the center as run by Communicare though. Oh. Did we clarify that? And that because, I think that's the con that yeah, just because the contract changed. Because we do have the data streets team, mm -hmm. the downtown streets team, excuse me. Yeah. Um get yeah, that contract shifted in, in January. Or I guess it ended with CUNICARE January? In, yeah, yeah, 2024. It ended right. earlier this year, so, so um, I'll have to make the transition to... Okay. I think it's like a small paragraph. Too. Okay. I don't think it's a, a big deal. Um, but okay, but that makes good sense and that's really, really helpful. And I guess you already clarified, I was going to ask you about how we talk about a number of programs and uh, affordable housing projects that were not funded by CDPG, but we put it in the context of how we're leveraging. Okay. Right. And right. some of that is we've used it in past years and we've pointed to it in our consolidated plan. Okay. So since we pointed to it in the original big plan, we'd like to kind of at least comment on it, comment on it when we're doing our paper. Okay, that makes good sense. On, I guess it's page 15, because mm -hmm. the page numbers are yeah. iffy, depending on where you're looking. Uh, um, yeah, this is uh, so. There's a, again, this goes into HUD's system. Right. So I might have a very pretty report that I got cut and paste no and put into their system. But yes. Well, I'm going to flag one more on okay. it, um, which is that um, this says that we still don't have a certified housing element. It's mm -hmm. the middle paragraph on page 15. Okay. Um, so I think that that's an example of, yeah, we should update that, that we are, we are in the green now okay. with that. Um, I have a couple others that I think I might just pass to you on paper, just where I caught the years okay. being off. Yes. I don't want to take the commission's time if that's okay with you. Okay. All right. The other
otherwise, once again, a huge amount of work. Like this, you know, so thank you, Dana and team, for putting this together to represent the good work of the city. I have one quick comment. Um, it, and this is neither here nor there because this is not really related to anything. But I'm noticing that one of the things that was mentioned here is uh, money for minority business enterprises and women business enterprises. And that was not part of the discussion that we had with our CPG round this year. And I'm just curious if that's if there's anything that we can do for the next round to encourage more of this. Absolutely. And that actually falls under economic development. And we, the city has hired an economic development manager. So now that we've got an economic development manager, I, I'm talking with her about what kinds of programs and projects she'd like to bring to the city. Um, and if there's some way we can carve out um, some funding for economic development. Um, because you'll you remember that um, we've got money carved out for fair housing. We can carve out money for economic development in the same way. And then that will kind of get us to that, that question. That's good. Thank you. Great. Any other? Okay. Great. All right, long range calendar. So I'm bringing this forward really to kind of remind everybody about how we were trying to plug things into this. Um, this is, I changed it to 24-25, but I haven't changed anything else because the last time we looked at it was May. So I thought I would just bring it forward and have you all have a discussion about if this format works, and then if we want to kind of keep to this monthly format of um, reporting and um, adding items that we want to review, and also wanted to know if we wanted to take another look um, at some of the language here on the bottom, because like there's this minimum responsibilities for the commission, I wanted to look at that again in light of what council is kind of um, thinking about. Um, I wanted to think about some items that should be standing items on this calendar too. You know, like our RFP process, when these reports are due, um, some of the major projects, I want to plug those in too. Um, and then I really need to readdress uh, what the sources of funding are over here because there are new sources and they're trying to give you guys some ideas of what's coming. So, and we should also take a look at, you know, when you'd like to recess next year, mm -hmm. and what that will look like. And, um, and then I want to make sure that I have the dates correct and locations for some, uh, we know some of your meetings fall on holidays, so make confirming those holiday dates too, and where we'll be. Because I know for sure, like next year for Martin Luther King's holiday, we move to uh, the following Monday, but that means that we're bumped out of this room and we'll be going over to the senior, to the senior center instead. So those are some things that I'm thinking about. I just wanted it on your radar. I'm gonna send this out so you can just kind of think about it. And then next meeting, maybe we can have a, what, what gets plugged in there. Is that okay? Yeah, good. President's Day. Yeah, yeah it's, it's every year it's the same. Yeah, it's, it's always. Over. Yeah, we know, it's just a few days that we kind of we know that we're gonna have to change dates, so let's get them up ahead of time, and and then I can reserve the rooms too. So I'll send this back out to everyone. Oh, I think it's the second and third that are two days, and then the third, so we'll meet on the fourth. Okay. okay. All right. Public well, comments. Seeing no public commenters. Okay. <coughs> do we have? We don't have any liaison reports, do we? We don't, and that's a, another thing that we can talk about. Um, what I will do is get everyone. I remind everyone what the agencies were that we funded, um, and then you can determine for the long range calendar 
who's going to pick, pick an agency and then report on it. Or you guys can arm wrestle for who's going to get which agency to, to go out and report on. Um, but I'll send the reminder out about who, who got funding. Um, and then at the next meeting, you can have a discussion about who gets who. And then you've got to report yes, this. Yes, I still have one. Yeah. Yeah. Done. yeah. So we can, it, and we can, again, we can either schedule it for the next meeting or you can, we'll have a conversation about when you want to present. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Public comments? Seeing no public comments? What's okay. the third development projects? So, um, our, uh, the person that manages our affordable housing sales is on vacation. So I just looked at her board uh, to kind of figure out, okay, what, what's in the pipeline. Um, it appears that we've got uh, five properties right now that are for sale, um, that are affordable units that are for sale, and they are on the market. And of those five properties, I think that we've got two that are in contract. So um, that's what we're along. I know she said for sure that we're seeing more interest um, in as far as people looking to qualify to be in the program. And we've kind of smoothed out the relationship with our realtor community so they have a better idea of how people are coming to them and how they're qualifying. So um, we're expecting to see an uptick um, in some of these units coming up for sale. And so I'll be updating you on that progress. And then as far as social services and housing update, is my hair on fire? There's a lot of stuff happening right now. Um, so I thought that we should, I, I'd give you a couple of quick updates, and I'll start with this one. Um, at the Respite Center, we had a couple of really great projects. Um, the Heart of Davis came out when it was super, super hot and helped the Respite Center by adding a shade structure. Um, so they placed that there, um, and it's been, it's been very helpful. Um, it's a temporary structure. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's getting windy. We're not sure <laughs> if, if we'll be able to keep it up, but it was very helpful when it was, when it was really hot, and I know the clients really appreciate that. And then the Lutheran Church of the Incarnate came out um, to the Restaurant Center as well. They've got a small patio that's adjacent to their office, um, and they came in and they painted it and added some, uh, they just made it a chalkboard there and then they added some furniture. It just made it another nice space for the guests to use. Um, so we were very appreciative of, of this project. And so that's an example of how some of our community orgs are kind of stepping in and, and to help out. Uh, we, I am in the process of uh, working with an engineer, I need a set of plans for our uh, ADA improvement. We're doing improvements to the ramp that gets you into the respite center. Um, so I'm working with uh, our engineer to kind of give me some basic as-built drawings so I can do a RFP to get a contractor in um, to, to complete the work. Um, so HUD first, this project next. That's kind of the, the, the process. Um, we do have a home strategic plan, and if you haven't seen it or don't have it, I will send it back out to you guys. What we have is, here's our strategy. What's next is, how do we put the strategy into action? So I'll be working with our providers and working with the community to come up with a steering committee that's going to be responsible for making the plan actionable. Um, so that's also in the works. And I don't know if you are aware, but uh, we had our point in time count. Point in time count is the census we do every January of how many people we uh, anticipate are homeless in the community. Point in time count numbers were released. It's the county that releases those numbers. We have a specific component for Davis. Um, and so I have the Davis report. Um, our numbers are slightly down um, in 2023, we were at 161. This year, we're showing, I'm sorry, in 2023, we were at 181. This year, we're showing 161. There are some uh, reasons behind that. Um, some of it to do with uh, more housing opportunities, um, people moving around. But 
I do have the point in time count, and I'll be sending that out to everybody too. Uh, I think the last thing I want to do is give an update on Pacifico, just so you know. Um, the county is moving forward with its rehabilitation of two buildings on the site there. The city owns um, a site called Pacifico. It was a former college dorm. There are four buildings on that site. Um, and the county is going to rehab two of those buildings, and they're going to uh, place people in their homeless, um, homeless support program. It's CalWorks Families. Um, they'll be they'll, they're rehabilitating it to place those people in there for emergency housing and some permanent housing. Um, now that we are sure about what the county is doing, the city is looking at the other two buildings. And we're talking with, we're proposing to talk with developers about helping us to develop the other two buildings as well. So there's progress on Pacific Coast right now. I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware. And I think that's my update for now. All right. Any public comments? Seeing none. All right, do we have any closing comments? I want to say welcome aboard. We're thrilled to have you. So look at this full, this full um, a commission. Great. Um, we are adjourned. See you next month. It usually goes. No, it usually doesn't go this long. It's <laughs> Oh, really? That's the answer.